the distinguished professor of New Testament here at Denver Seminary. God has not only given him a great gift in, in, may I just call it brilliance, in his ability to open the scriptures and to make us all think, but he's given him a wonderful personality. Uh, He uh, is seen with a perpetual smile, I think, on his face, and people who come to his office or to his home always feel very warmly welcomed. And so I'm delighted tonight to present as our first speaker of this conference, Dr. Craig Blomberg, and ask him to come tonight. God bless. It more likely has something to do with my strange sense of humor and or lifelong dream of seeing the Chicago Cubs in a World Series. (laughs) I I think there's a paradigm there of the Christian life somehow that uh, always, always waiting for the eschaton. (laughs) Thank you, Gordon. Jesus shall reign where'er the sun doth his successive journeys run. His kingdom stretch from shore to shore till moon shall wax and wane no more. So begins the classic hymn penned by Isaac Watts in 1719, sung in countless churches of all major theological stripes ever since often without awareness that it reflected an explicitly post-millennial outlook. The hymn includes 14 verses that make clear the conviction that the gospel will spread throughout the globe until the vast majority of the world's inhabitants become Christians. Stanzas 2 and 3, for example, continue... Behold the islands with their kings, and Europe her best tribute brings. From north and south the princes meet to pay their homage at his feet. There Persia glorious to behold, there India shines in eastern gold, and barbarous nations at his word submit and bow and own their Lord. Perhaps if Watts were writing today, he would have found ways to refer to Korea. And China instead. Ask the average North American today which of all the doctrines typically found in a church's or parachurch's organizational statement of faith could be most readily excised without significant loss. And there's a good chance the answer will be its position on the millennium. Yet historically, this has not always been so. In various times and places, including certain parts of the Christian world, even in the 21st century, it has made a huge difference to people, whether one is a premillennialist, believing that Christ will return before the millennium, a postmillennialist, believing that Christ will return after the millennium, or an amillennialist, believing that there is no literal millennium. Each of these approaches in turn subdivides into two additional major categories. Premillennialists may be dispensational, usually believing in a rapture of the church separate from and prior to the tribulation or the worst of the tribulation at the end of the age, or classic or historic premillennialism usually believing that the rapture depicts believers welcoming Christ as he returns in glory at the end of the tribulation and escorting him to earth in triumph. The former approach is called pre-tribulational, the latter post-tribulational. Amillennialists have typically held that believers now reign spiritually, with Christ, and that the thousand years of Revelation 20, hence the term millennium, are not a literal period of Christ reigning on earth at all, as premillennialists believe. Today, however, some have equated it metaphorically with the new heavens and the new earth. Postmillennialists, finally, have typically viewed the evangelistic and missionary efforts of believers 
as one day being overwhelmingly successful worldwide, thereby Christianizing the better part of the world's population. In recent days, however, a theonomist form of postmillennialism has sought to reestablish biblical law as the mandate for believers' behavior and government's legislation, thus giving rise to a dominion theology that looks forward to the bulk of the world just before Christ's return, not only trusting in him as Lord and Savior, but following God's laws personally and politically. It seems unlikely, however, that this movement will gain any widespread or more widespread momentum, despite the disproportionately large volume of, of material its comparatively small number of supporters generates. Indeed, especially with the untimely death of Greg Bonson, one of its most ardent supporters, it would appear that it already is losing a little momentum. Because I've been asked to give three talks at this conference, and because the choice of plenary speaker required someone who would defend historic premillennialism, which I do, it seemed natural to spend one talk each on the three major competitors with this form of eschatology, including dispensational premillennialism as an alternative all by itself, as it has often been treated in theology textbooks. Thus, today, we will consider why I find postmillennialism less convincing than historic premillennialism, and then repeat the process over the next two days with respect to amillennialism, and if anybody comes back on Saturday morning, dispensational premillennialism. Before proceeding, a few caveats are in order. First, I'm a New Testament scholar, not a church historian, systematic theologian, or Old Testament scholar, though I have read a fair amount in all those areas. Because our constraints of time would not permit me to survey and interact with the whole range of supporting arguments for any of these eschatological perspectives, it makes sense for me to concentrate primarily on the New Testament support to which they appeal. Even then, I will need to be selective and try to choose areas that are not already worn out with exegeses that seldom say anything new or need to. Second, a large part of me tends to agree with those pundits who lament past overemphases on these debates and call for doctrinal statements to allow for complete diversity on the topic, not insisting that believers must hold any specific millennial position in order to be a part of their church organization. As the clip has often phrased it, let's just all be content to be pan-millennialists, knowing that with Christ's return it will all pan out in the end. At the same time, I fear that in our anti-doctrinal age, we may throw the proverbial baby, or perhaps several babies, out with the bathwater in so doing. For those who understand the interconnectedness of all the major Christian doctrines, there are issues at stake, not always directly dealt with in conversations limited to eschatology, which receive quite different answers depending on one's millennial approach. And these are worth taking quite seriously. Thus, third, I will conclude each of these talks with some reflections on some of those broader issues, so that even if we rightly exercise greater charity to fellow believers who differ with us on these topics than has sometimes been the case, we can also see why the conversations are worth having. Indeed, why a conference such as this is worth having. With that introduction, let us turn to postmillennialism in more detail. Postmillennialist pillars. Donald Blesch lists an impressive array of Christian leaders throughout the centuries who have propounded most or all of postmillennial thought, including Eusebius of Caesarea, the first true church historian, writing in the early 4th century, 
Joachim of Fiore in the 13th century, the Anabaptist Melchior Hoffman, and pietists or Puritans Philip Spenner, Daniel Whitby, John Owen, Samuel Rutherford, John and Charles Wesley, and Jonathan Edwards. In the late 19th and early 20th century, postmillennialism's adherents included Charles Hodge, Benjamin Warfield, Augustus Strong, James Orr, and the more liberal social gospeler Walter Rauschenbusch. In the middle of the 20th century, one may include Ian Murray, Lorraine Bettner, and Hendrikus Burkhoff. To Blesch's names, we must add famous Bible commentators and expositors from a previous era, Matthew Henry, John Gill, Adam Clark, Robert Jameson, A.R. Fawcett, and David Brown. In Baptist circles, B.H. Carroll, founder of Southwestern Baptist Seminary in Fort Worth, Fort Worth, Texas, has been called the last of the ardent post-millennialists of the 19th century. From our day, we must add especially the names of theologians John Jefferson Davis, Rusas Rushduni, Marcellus Kick, Greg Bonson, David Chilton, Kenneth Gentry, Gary DeMar, Keith Matheson, and R.C. Sproul. In general, postmillennialism has most often proved strongest in those times and places when the gospel is making significant inroads into a given culture, both through the conversion of individuals and through its impact on society. It's natural for people to begin to envisage a large portion of the world becoming Christianized when they see such advances even if they recognize it may still be generations into the future. Conversely, when postmillennialism captures the hearts and minds of significant Christian leaders who in turn communicate it to others, evangelism and missionary activity frequently increase and people begin to strategize as to how to have a greater influence in the public square. But in times of war or natural disaster or when Christian religions, when non-Christian religions and or atheism seems to grow rapidly, belief in post-millennialism understandably wanes. At the same time, Blesch astutely observes that the various movements that have envisioned this world demonstrating significant improvement in protecting individual rights, reducing warfare and other forms of human-caused suffering, often, though not always, with God's people at the forefront of such movements, represent a less overtly Christian or sometimes fully secularized equivalent to post-millennialism. Scientists and doctors today who believe, for example, that technology holds within it the cure to all our social ills and that we can anticipate a day in the future when people and nations live far more at peace with one another than they currently do and that new discoveries or inventions will alleviate human suffering in general much more than they do now are for all intents and purposes secular post-millennialists envisioning a coming golden age of human history before any form of judgment or dissolution of this universe. If indeed any such interruption in paradise awaits humanity at all. The scriptural support for distinctively evangelical Christian forms of postmillennialism has often been chronicled. Various Old Testament passages envision a world in which God's people and his ways appear to have largely triumphed. Numbers 14.21 speaks of the glory of the Lord filling the whole earth. Psalm 2.8 finds God promising that if his people ask him, he will make the nations your inheritance and the ends of the earth your possessions. Psalm 72 depicts millennial conditions in Israel when a king or royal son rules with justice and righteousness to the ends of the earth and when monarchs from around the world bring him tribute and serve him. Then God's promises to Abraham, beginning in Genesis 12, 1 to 3, will be fulfilled as of this messianic king, David declares all nations will be blessed through him 
and they will call him blessed. Psalm 72, 17. Isaiah 11, 6 to 9, envisions similar paradise when the wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child shall lead them. Again, infants will play near the hole of the cobra. Young children will put their hands into the viper's nest. Today, moms, better keep them away. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Zechariah 9.10 promises a day when Israel will no longer need any military or its weapons because the messianic king will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. One could make similar observations about parts of Psalms 22, 47, 67, 86, 100, Isaiah 2, 65 to 66, Ezekiel 40 to 48, Daniel 2 and 7, and Joel 3. With premillennialism, but against amillennialism, postmillennialism takes the prophecies of a glorious renewed, gloriously renewed earth with a golden age of peace, prosperity, and justice, even though not yet perfected or rid of evil and death, as a long period of time still to be fulfilled literally on this earth. In the New Testament, postmillennialists frequently cite the parables of growth, especially the mustard seed and the leaven understanding them to teach that the kingdom of God will steadily expand until it covers a shockingly large percentage of the earth's expanse with explicitly Christian disciples and discipleship, just like the proverbially tiny mustard seed produces. In this instance, an astonishingly large mustard plant so as to be called a tree with space for birds of every kind, representing all nations, Ezekiel 17.23 to find shade in its branches. Or just like the three seahs of leaven would produce enough bread to feed a crowd of almost 150 people. The text in which Christ promises Peter that from his initial leadership of the church, he will build a movement over which the powers of hell cannot prevail. Matthew 16, 18. Likewise suggests to some a worldwide Christian empire at the end of this era of human history. Still another commonly cited text is 1 Corinthians 15.25, in which Christ reigns until he has put all enemies under his feet. The trouble with the texts. The problem with all of these texts, however, is that they simply do not indicate one way or the other any necessary relationship to Christ's return. They could all well be fulfilled in a millennium that occurs after the parousia, the second coming, rather than before. Or perhaps the pervasiveness of Christian influence that is promised is not nearly as all-encompassing as postmillennialists have classically envisaged. What is more, the Last of these passages cited, 1 Corinthians 15.25, is much more naturally understood as occurring at the end of a millennium that follows Jesus' return. Because verses 23 to 24 appear to establish the following sequence of events. One, the resurrection of Christ. Two, the resurrection of believers. Three, a period of time in which all of God's enemies are finally dealt with. And four... The end. Surely this chronology fits a premillennial scheme better than a postmillennial one. Still, other texts anticipate considerable growth in the quality and quantity of Christianity before the return of Christ, but stop short of depicting the unparalleled conditions described in the standard millennial texts. For example, John 12, 31 to 32, has Jesus declaring, Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of the world will be driven out. 
And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Jesus does indeed pronounce a decisive conquest of Satan through his crucifixion. But the rest of the New Testament makes clear the amount of damage he can still inflict while in his death throes in the period between Jesus' first and second comings. Verse 32 does promise that many will come in Christ, come to Christ with all, probably meaning those from all people groups. Note the context of Greeks coming in verse 20, wanting to see Jesus. Not every last inhabitant on earth. Who in Jesus' world would ever have imagined today, 2,000 years later, when over 2 billion people on planet Earth would claim to be followers of Jesus of some kind? But neither would anyone then have imagined a population approaching 7 billion, so that the Earth can hardly be said today to have been Christianized. Romans 11, 11 to 32, is often brought to bear on our topic as well. Paul's powerful metaphor of Israel as an olive tree with branches broken off due to unbelief and new branches from a wild olive tree grafted in, representing Gentiles who come to faith in Christ, culminates with the prospect of original branches being re-engrafted as well. When the full number of Gentiles has come in, verse 25, then all Israel will be saved. Romans 11.26 Even if we allow for all to mean a very large number, though not literally 100%, as it often does elsewhere, given the world demographics already observed, all the Gentiles who will respond positively to Christ, along with most Jews, surely constitutes a significant advance for God's kingdom on earth prior to Christ's return which is depicted in the rest of verse 26 and verse 27. So the post-millennialist would argue. But again, such a large number could still wind up being a minority of the world's population, especially in light of Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount on the comparatively few number who enter through the narrow gate to travel on the narrow road. Matthew 7, 13 to 14. Compare also Christ's words at the end of the parable of the wedding banquet, for many are invited, but few are chosen. Matthew 22, 14. Post-millennialism's most important and enduring contribution is thus also even more consistent with historic premillennialism. Whereas dispensationalism has often focused on how things will go from bad to worse as Christ's return nears, and especially during the Great Tribulation which immediately precedes the parousia, and whereas amillennialism has no particular reason to see any great change in the amount of good or bad, Christian or non-Christian influence at the end times, postmillennialism can look forward with optimism to significant advances in God's kingdom, considerable growth of the church, encouraging numbers of people becoming followers of Jesus, and encouraging social impact in helping the poor and disenfranchised and in making parts of this world noticeably better loving places. When one studies the history of Christian influence, often a disproportionately large influence on major advances throughout the last 2,000 years of world history, in the abolition of slavery, in the establishment of hospitals, in the quest for advances in the medical field, in championing human rights and legal, in the legal and judicial realms, in the quest for literacy and for developing educational opportunities for more people and at higher levels, and even in the motivation for many key scientific pioneers over the centuries to say nothing of regular humanitarian aid, the development of welfare systems, concern for the urban poor, and so on, then one has good reason to believe that still further improvement in the quality of human life may yet lie on our horizon, with Christians potentially at the forefront of those movements. We need to hear that message from post-millennialists. The biggest problem, however, for postmillennialism 
as is frequently pointed out by advocates of the other eschatological systems, is what to do with suffering throughout the church age in general and the tribulation in particular. While a few post-millennialists allow for a tribulation after the millennium, but still before Christ's return, and while others take the biblical descriptions of tribulation as depicting the hostility between God and Satan throughout history, the most popular approach for post-millennialists today is to adopt the preterist perspective on New Testament prophecy and see the predictions of a great tribulation, or simply great tribulation, as fulfilled in the first century, especially in the events leading up to and or including the destruction of the temple and much of Jerusalem by the Romans in A.D. 70. We will have more to say about this line of interpretation in a moment. For now, however, the important point is to observe that historic premillennialism uniquely allows for both the growth in the positive impact of the kingdom of God in our world throughout church history and the increase of evil in unprecedented amounts at the end of the age. Indeed, in keeping with Tertullian's famous dictum that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church, we should not be surprised when good and evil grow in tandem. Persecution of God's people has regularly spurred church growth. Whether because unbelievers have marveled over the hope with which believers die, or because they are convicted concerning the sinfulness of promoting innocent suffering and repent as a result. Conversely, noticeable upswings in the growth of the church lead the evil one to redouble his efforts to attack God's people and his work. The 20th century saw more martyrs for the Christian faith than in all of the previous 19 centuries of church history combined. Even as it saw some of the most explosive church growth in history, especially in Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and South Southeast and East Asia. Whatever one makes of the precise identity of the two witnesses of Revelation 11, surely the main theological point of that chapter is the progressive polarization of good and evil, of God's purposes and diabolical opposition in what characterizes the end times. And historic premillennialism is the most theologically equipped system of eschatology to account for both of these simultaneously because it alone consistently expects great tribulation and the increase of great evil just before Christ's return while simultaneously affirming that God's people remain a leavening force in this world right up to the very end, the very parousia of Christ, working powerful signs and wonders just as the two witnesses are depicted doing in Revelation 11. A new kind of date setting. Not talking about helping out any single people in the audience. So much for the moment for conventional postmillennialism. But there is a more subtle form of postmillennialism that may in fact not even think of itself as that. And it is far more widespread across Christian thought than just in those traditions that have consciously adopted postmillennialist eschatology. It's an approach that I first encountered in college in the chapter of Campus Crusade for Christ in which I participated. In the early to mid-1970s, Bill Bright, that organization's founder and longtime president, liked to sign letters that were duplicated and sent out to students and supporters alike, reading, Years for Fulfilling the Great Commission in America by 1976 and in the World by 1980. Oh, that's right. My watch doesn't give the year. 
After all, 1976 was going to be America's bicentennial anniversary. What better a date to set than that for letting every American hear and have a chance to respond to the gospel, at least as summarized in the four spiritual laws. And if Americans were so mobilized and Christianized by then, surely it wouldn't take much longer at all for us to fan out throughout the world and reach what was then about four billion people on the planet. I confess I found this all rather ridiculous at the time, but that wasn't a popular view to hold. It reminded me of the church growth campaigns, equally unrealistic, to increase weekly attendance to 777 by 1977, or to raise 79,000 by 1979 for a large new wing to be added onto the church building. And yes, those were very big numbers for those enterprises in downstate Illinois where I lived in those days. But I also recognize that such techniques were partly motivational in nature, at least in aiming for something well beyond our means, we were likely to accomplish more than if we set more modest goals. It was only when I went on to seminary that I discovered a theological response to this strategy. Meanwhile, we have lived through the era of extraordinary hoopla surrounding the countdown to the new millennium that began nine years ago. Anybody remember Y2K? While most people were were obsessed with absurd prophecies about worldwide computer meltdowns and the Armageddons to which they would lead, a smaller group of people were ambitiously targeting 2000 as the year of completing worldwide evangelism. One organization even took its name from this objective, AD 2000. As the fascinating year drew ever closer and it was obvious we were nowhere close to fulfilling the Great Commission, the organization quietly changed its name to AD 2000 and beyond. The tacitly post-millennial approach of which I am thinking has also permeated successive editions of the highly influential primer Perspectives on the World Christian Movement, used over the years in numerous Christian colleges and seminaries, even of other eschatological persuasions, including our own, and in countless churches of virtually every denominational stripe around the country and at times overseas. The Chinese spawned back to Jerusalem movement likewise conceives of completing the Great Commission by finishing the circumnavigation of the globe with its proclamation. Just as church history thus far can be traced as the gospel primarily moving westward around the world from Israel through Europe and North Africa to the Americas and then to East Asia, many Chinese look forward to completing the circuit by heading west through the Middle East and some of the countries today most impervious to the gospel, then reaching Jerusalem again. Then the Great Commission will have been fulfilled. Then Christ can return. Little wonder that Timothy Tennant compares this movement with the far more explicitly post-millennialist eschatology of Jonathan Edwards in his important recent textbook, Theology in the Context of World Christianity. The linchpin of this more informal postmillennialism, whether of perspectives in Back to Jerusalem or Campus Crusade in AD 2000 and beyond, involves the Great Commission, a key text about which we have thus far said nothing. And it includes the conviction that the Great Commission must be fulfilled before Jesus can return. This conviction in turn spurs on evangelism and church planting efforts so that we do not thwart God and hinder Christ's return. After all, does not 2 Peter 3.12 speak of speeding the coming of the day of the Lord by holy and godly living? And sharing our faith certainly lies at the heart of obedient, God-pleasing lifestyles. So presumably our disobedience and lack of evangelistic zeal would slow down the second coming. 
Or at least that is what many Christians appear to think. This fascination with our ability to manipulate God underlies various heterodox movements as well, such as Mike Bickle's Kansas City-based International House of Prayer movement that sees Christ's return dependent on the existence of an elite cadre of round-the-clock, non-stop intercessors who pray through the eschatological texts of Scripture thereby making it possible for God to start unleashing on the world the judgments found in those texts. But wait. Matthew 28, 18 to 20, the fullest text in which Christ commissions the twelve to go and make disciples of all people groups, says nothing about any link to Christ's return nor do any of the shorter parallel versions in the other Gospels. Second Peter 3.12 does speak of our hastening the day, but in direct contrast with verse 9, where God appears to delay the end so that fewer might perish and more repent. Verse 9 does, sorry, verse 9 does not suggest that God keeps changing the day on which Jesus will come back based on how recalcitrant unbelievers are responding to the gospel. It just means that the day he has fixed in his sovereign omniscience is one that seems to us as if he is delaying too long. So there's no reason to imagine that he would move that date to a nearer day, an hour, simply because his people have finally shared their faith with representatives of all major people groups but it will feel to us as if it is being sped up. Because time will fly as we are doing God's will, and the already established date will indeed draw ever nearer. In fact, some elementary theological reflection should alert us to the likelihood that something is quite amiss with the notion that we can objectively change the day God has fixed for the parousia, either by our disobedience or by our obedience to his call on our lives. Most of us have learned that it is wrong to say that Christ must come back by a certain date because it violates Mark 13.32 and Acts 1.7 about neither Jesus in his incarnate state nor we as his disciples knowing the day, hour, times, or seasons of his return. But then surely we must intuit that it is just as inappropriate to say that Christ cannot come back by a certain date for the very same reason. Can't we recognize that to claim that our disobedience can thwart God's will compromises his sovereignty as much as among the most Pelagian advocate of works righteousness with respect to salvation. Where does this notion really come from? Fulfilling the Great Commission first? There is one final text that we have deliberately saved for a more in-depth analysis that explains the pervasiveness and popularity of this misperception. It is Matthew 24:14, and is parallel in Mark 13:10. In its Matthean form, it reads, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Mark has a shorter version that states merely, and the gospel first must be preached to all nations. But the idea remains implicit that this is a prerequisite before the unfolding of the final events Jesus predicts in his Olivet Discourse. The popular perception of the meaning of Jesus' words here is that the Great Commission, as we know it in full from Matthew 28:19 must be fulfilled before Christ can come back. Is that really what Jesus is teaching here? A more careful look at the structure and contents of his message in Matthew 24 is required. Jesus has left the temple 
for what will be the last time during his earthly life. He has taken the disciples up the slopes of the Mount of Olives and astonishingly, he has predicted the destruction of this amazingly magnificent and holy building. The disciples understandably ask when this will happen and what will be the sign of his second coming and of the end of the age. While in their minds, they could well have assumed that only as cataclysmic an event as the end of human history as they knew it could bring about the destruction of the eighth wonder of the ancient world. To understand Jesus' reply correctly, we must recognize that he distinguished his answers to these two questions. Verses 4 to 20 address only their first question about when the very temple they are currently admiring will be destroyed. As Timothy Geddert has shown in comprehensive detail for the parallel account in Mark, Jesus begins by playing down eschatological fervor. People will dis, uh, the disciples are not to imagine that the catastrophe will occur immediately. People will deceptively make messianic claims. Wars and rumors of wars will lead some to think that the tribulation, often known in Jewish circles as the messianic woes, is at hand. Such things must happen. But the end is still to come. Second half of verse 6. The NRSV, ESV, NASB, and HCSB capture the force slightly more clearly than do the NIV and TNIV with their rendering, the end is not yet. Verse 7 adds to the list of preliminary events that are not to be treated as decisive signs, international conflict, famines, and earthquakes. How ironic that many Christians around the world and throughout the ages seeing such events have regularly assumed that these were signs of the imminent coming of Christ when Christ himself explicitly said that they were not. Verse 8 drives the point home further with a powerful metaphor from a woman's experience of pregnancy. All this is but the beginning of birth pangs. Again with the NRSV, ESV, and NASB. Labor pains demonstrate that there is a baby inside its mother, but they are notoriously unhelpful in predicting exactly when she will deliver, especially when they turn out to be false labor pangs. Verses 9 to 13 add still more elements to the list of preliminary events, persecution, even to the point of martyrdom, worldwide hatred, apostasy, betrayal, more false and deceitful prophets, and lovelessness. What is striking about this collection of misfortunes is that all of them occurred within the first generation of Christian history, before A.D. 70. Acts alone refers to false prophets and messiahs, an empire-wide famine, a violent earthquake, and repeated persecution for the first followers of Jesus by Jews, Greeks, and Romans alike. Josephus and various Roman historians add numerous references to other would-be prophets and messiahs, more earthquakes, persecution, betrayal, and to the same famine. And of course, the zealot rebellion of the late 60s, culminating in the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, certainly qualifies as a war. If we skip Matthew 24, 14 for a moment and continue reading in verses 15 to 20, the only natural way to take Jesus' words about a desolating sacrilege standing in the holy place is to understand it referring to something blasphemous violating the sanctity of the very first century temple down upon which the disciples are gazing. This would account as well for Jesus' concern that people who are forced to flee the holy city not be pregnant, making travel much more difficult, or having to escape during winter when Judean rains often turn the dirt roads into quagmires, making it much harder to travel, or on a Sabbath 
when shops were closed and provisions would be harder to obtain. Surely then, if there were any natural way to understand Matthew 24, 14, as also applying to the events leading up to AD 70, that would be the preferable interpretation. But can it be said that during this first 40-year period of Christian history, the gospel was preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations? As a matter of fact, it can. The word translated whole world is oikumene, which was regularly used in Jesus' day for the Roman Empire, roughly coterminous with the known world for Israelites at that time. It appears that it was Paul's goal to plant churches in representative regions of that entire oikumene, which would then carry on his evangelistic mission in their local regions. In Romans 15:17, Paul tells the Romans that in essence, he has finished the task in the eastern, more Hellenistic half of the empire. So from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum, modern-day Albania, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. Now he's hoping to come to Rome and be helped on his journey from there all the way to Spain, thus covering the western, more Romanized half of the empire. Although scripture is silent as to whether Paul did in fact make it that far, two reasonably reliable early Christian sources suggest that he did. First Clement 5.5-7 5, and Eusebius' church history, 2.22, just before his martyrdom under Nero, sometime between A.D. 64 and 68. Be that as it may, already in the early 60s, Paul can write the Colossians that the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. Colossians 1, six. Later in the same letter, he adds that the gospel has been preached in all creation. Verse 23, the more literal rendering following the NASB, ESV, and HCSB as over against to every creature, as in the NRSV, NIV, and TNIV. Clearly, Paul can use language very similar to that of Christ's prediction in the Olivet Discourse, about what he believes has already occurred in his day. Paradoxically, the very approach that post-millennialists most often take with respect to the historical events Jesus promises preceding his return, that they were fulfilled in the first century, is the one many inconsistently abandon when using Matthew 24:14 in support of a still future worldwide outpouring of the Spirit to create a largely Christianized planet. Like the events of Matthew 24, 4 to 20, apart from verse 14, this verse also has already been fulfilled in the first Christian generation, even with more modest results than some post-millennialists might like. How does the rest of Jesus' eschatological discourse cohere with this interpretation of Matthew 24, 14? If all of verses 4 to 20 occurred by A.D. 70, what are we to make of verse 21? For then there will be great distress, tribulation, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now and never to be equaled again. Many postmillennialists allege that this too was fulfilled in the events leading up to and including A.D. 70, but it's hard to see the war between Rome and Jerusalem as the greatest tribulation ever in world history, devastating though it was. Or what of verse 29, which describes Christ's return immediately after the tribulation of those days? Again, employing thlipsis to refer to this horrible time. One can understand why dispensationalists have often imagined that Jesus must be speaking of a short period of time just before the parousia, so that the destruction of the temple depicted earlier in this discourse must refer to the destruction of a rebuilt temple in the last days. 
One alternative for post-millennialists and also amillennialists is to take even the cosmic signs and the coming of the Son of Man, which they usher in, as completely metaphorical. N.T. Wright has popularized this perspective in recent years, highlighting how often in the Old Testament prophecy about coming earthly judgments, changes in empires, victories and defeats of earthly regimes, the language of cosmic upheaval is used. He argues that all of the parousia passages in the Gospels refer to Christ's invisible return in judgment on Jerusalem at the hands of the Romans in the first century. Wright also believes that beginning in Acts 1-7 and continuing throughout the rest of the New Testament, the inspired writers do speak of a future visible return of Christ. But he struggles to explain how such a belief developed if Jesus himself never anticipated it. It's sometimes argued that the allusion to Daniel 7-13 about one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven in Matthew 24:30 makes it clear that Jesus is not thinking of a return to earth. After all, the human-like figure of Daniel 7:13 is using heavenly transport to be ushered into God's presence, where he is given universal dominion over the kingdoms of the earth. RT France had been vigorously arguing for this perspective well before Wright made it far better known. But travel from the clouds to God's throne room would not be an event as visible as the lightning flashing from east to west as in Matthew 24, 27. And Jesus directly contrasts his prediction with those that claim a more hidden coming of Messiah. A non-literal parousia would not likely be accompanied by a visible celestial sign causing all peoples of the earth to mourn. It would not be an event that all people would see. Indeed, the one other time Jesus alludes to Daniel 7.13, this clearly at his trial before the Sanhedrin in Matthew 24.64 in parallels, he elaborates, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. The exaltation precedes the coming. As George Beasley Murray stresses, the word order strongly suggests that here Jesus is foreseeing his traveling from heaven to earth, not the other way around, as in Daniel. This appears to be the best way to understand Matthew 24, 30 as well. A final exegetical conundrum in this discourse requiring comment involves verse 34. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Taken out of context, the verse can indeed be viewed as supporting the belief that Christ would return during the disciples' lifetime, a view which then has to be interpreted as referring to something other than the second coming. Commentators have made numerous suggestions, the resurrection, exaltation, sending of the Spirit at Pentecost, or coming in judgment on Israel at 8070. Dispensationalists classically understood this generation to mean the one alive when the signs start to unfold, including the construction of a rebuilt temple. But everywhere else in Matthew, in fact in all of the Gospels, this generation always refers to the one alive during Jesus' earthly ministry. A completely preterist interpretation would argue that even Christ's return occurred during the first century. But as we have already seen, this is unlikely. A better option than either of these two is to keep verse 34 in its immediate context. What are all these things of which verse 34 speaks? At the risk of sounding pedantic, we must look for the nearest preceding antecedent. The previous verse reads, even so, when you see all these things, you know that it, or he, is near right at the door. Verse 33. All these things in verse 34 has to be the same as all these things in verse 33. 
My girls would have said at a younger age, duh. But in verse 33, all these things cannot include Christ's return. They must be limited to the sum total of all the preliminary events Jesus has prophesied up to, but not including the parousia or anything like the heavenly signs that is inherently bound up with it. Otherwise, Christ would be saying in part, even so, when you see my return, know that I am near. I hear another duh coming. At this point, it's too late to speak of Christ's return simply as near. It has arrived. So the all these things, verses 33 to 34, must refer to everything predicted thus far in the chapter minus Christ's return per se. All of the signs that aren't really signs occurred within the first generation of Christianity. All have, in fact, frequently occurred throughout church history. And this includes preaching the gospel throughout the known world as a testimony to all its peoples and ethnic groups. Given the ancient rabbinic division of ethne into only 70 or 72 such groups, it may be that a majority of these were represented already even at Pentecost, with the festival throngs from all over the empire streaming to Jerusalem. At any rate... There is no compelling reason to overthrow centuries of traditional interpretation and take the coming of the Son of Man here as anything other than a still future, visible, public return of Jesus for all humanity to observe. In light of the time and my proclivity to write a lot, I am going to move to theological reflection, which means we are nearing a different kind of end. With Matthew twenty four fourteen plausibly interpreted as referring to first century texts, there are no remaining exegetical reasons for adopting post millennialism's optimism as to how Christian the world will be just before Christ returns. We must agree with postmillennialism and indeed with most all lines of serious scholarship that to say that Jesus must come back by a certain date or decade or generation or century violates what the Bible says, either Jesus in his incarnate state can know or his followers after his resurrection are permitted to know. But these principles then apply equally to those who argue that Jesus cannot come back until a certain date, era, or level of obedience, such as fulfilling the Great Commission, is attained. It goes well beyond what Jesus or his followers can or will know, and it is therefore distracting speculation at best and at worst, outright heresy. It can also lead, wittingly or unwittingly, to inappropriate motivation by false guilt. Get out there and share your faith, or you'll keep our Lord from returning. For anyone still unpersuaded by all of the exegesis just concluded, consider two other arguments. First, even if Matthew 24, 14 did mean that the Great Commission had to be fulfilled before Christ could return, ought we not to ask whether the 70 or 72 peoples into which ancient Jews divided the world have been evangelized or not? Not the thousands of subgroups into which modern ethnographers divide the world. And if that is the case, then... Missionary travels can quickly demonstrate that at least some part of each of these regions have been evangelized, often many times over. Second, even if one were to adopt a more detailed and precise scheme for the table of nations, how would we know when every people group had had a chance to hear the gospel? Maybe we need only one member of each ethnos to have heard. 
and have had a chance to respond to the Christian message for the Great Commission to have been fulfilled in that subgroup. Given the number of times throughout church history and today, especially in closed Muslim countries, when individuals have been introduced to the gospel through a vision or dream of Christ or an angel, or by finding scripture portions or hearing radio broadcasts or seeing television shows or surfing the internet, how could we ever know when a given ethnos had or had not heard the gospel? Even with the more expansive commission of Matthew 28:19, not tied to any timetable, we may be much closer to fulfillment than we realize. Andrew Kirk, longtime Latin American missionary, uh, British missionary in Latin America, and as far as I know, no relation to James T., nicely summarizes the gospel of the kingdom with the following words. The kingdom sums up God's plan to create a new human life by making possible a new kind of community among people, families, and groups. It combines the possibility of a personal relationship to Jesus with human responsibility to manage wisely the whole of nature. The expectation that real change is possible here and now and a realistic assessment of the strength of the opposition to God's intentions the creation of new human relationships, and the eventual liberation by God of the whole of nature from corruption. I'm particularly struck by Kirk's juxtaposition of the two clauses, the expectation that real change is possible here and now, and a realistic assessment of the strength of opposition to God's intentions. Postmillennialists well stress the former, dispensationalists the latter, but neither eschatological scheme, in my opinion, does justice to the one that the other emphasizes. Amillennialists can hold the two together as timeless competing forces, but historic premillennialism will see, in addition, an increase of both simultaneously as we approach Christ's return. How can we account for the callous cruelty of terrorists flying planes into the World Trade Center towers on September 11, 2001, alongside the heroism of rescue workers sacrificing their lives, trying to get victims still trapped in the collapsing buildings? On a macro scale, how do we best explain why the 20th century, the century of unparalleled technological progress, was simultaneously saw more people respond to the gospel by putting their faith in Jesus Christ, and yet more Christians martyred for their faith than in all previous centuries of church history combined? The population explosion can explain part but only part of these record numbers paradoxically occurring simultaneously. If the world is indeed getting more violent rather than safer, more filled with suffering rather than physical and mental wholeness, even as millions increasingly bow the knee to Jesus Christ, perhaps this is experiential support for the claims of historic premillennialism. In this event, we should not be surprised if both trends accelerate in the years to come. The one should temper somewhat our euphoria about how many are coming to Christ. The other should somewhat mitigate our shock at the extent of evil that still occurs. Perhaps what appears to be a growing polarization between good and evil, between Christ and Antichrists, is merely a perception. Maybe with the hindsight of many more decades or even centuries of history, without Christ having come back, we will see that this was just one of many periods of intense flurries of activity of good and evil, separated by calmer periods with neither extreme as prevalent. We're too close to the events of our era to know if current trends support the 
more static eschatology of amillennialism or the increasing polarization of historic premillennialism near the end. Besides, exegesis, not experience, should always be our first line of appeal in adjudicating among competing theological systems. So tomorrow, if anyone comes back, we will turn to amillennialism to see if its exegetical strengths outweigh those of historical premillennialism or vice versa. The end. <laughs>